Welcome and happy Sabbath. We are delighted to have you join us this morning for our Green Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church online service. It's a bit rainy outside, but it's warm and cozy in here. And as we start our service, please join us for a lovely prelude by Wanda Griffiths, our Minister of Music. Again, another warm welcome for joining us this morning. We are grateful that you're choosing to spend your time with us today. I'm Erica Orban, and it is my honor to be guiding you through our service this morning. I was walking around outside this past week, and I've noticed that spring was fully in the air, and it was just so beautiful with the flowers uh, starting to, to show up and blossom. And I thought we're at the one year mark, about the one year mark from when uh, our doors had to be closed because of the current pandemic. So I thought I'd share some of the beauty that's around here so that you could enjoy them with me. So I made a bouquet of flowers from um, just around the church. We have our rhododendrons right outside the window. Um, the pink ones that are in full bloom and are stunning. And there is one shrub right in front of the church of the white ones that's blooming as well. These um, Japanese Andromedas are uh, delightful and they have the most amazing scent. We also have some baby daffodils around the Meridian house and some marigolds that are blooming as well. So I'll have them right behind me so that you could enjoy it with me today. Um, we have a few announcements in our church life sections. And first, if you are not receiving the e-bulletins that come out on Thursdays, please email us at glcsda at gmail.com uh, and we will make sure to get you on that list. So first off in our church life section is Wanda with some birthdays. Thank you, Erica. 
the flowers that uh, you have presented are so beautiful. So we're going to just say that those flowers are bouquets for each of the birthday wishes today. Thank you for sharing those. It's beautiful. And I was at the church yesterday to prepare uh, to make some more recordings and I saw the pink trees. The trees are budding out with pink all over the place. So that was a delight. Our first Excuse me, my first birthday greeting goes out to Barbara Chanawada. You may remember the beautiful video that he shared a few weeks back from the um, school in India where our hands across the water monies go sometimes. So we wish you a wonderful birthday this week, Barbara. And then I'm also sending out birthday greetings today to Hayden Hamilton. We hope you have a wonderful birthday this week and look forward to seeing you back in worship at some point when we can all be together. And then uh, Maria Kapush, it's her, uh, Maria Kapush O'Neill, whose birthday is this week. Maria, we wish you a wonderful birthday. And so with that, I'm gonna send it to Gumi who has some more birthday greetings. Yeah, there's more birthdays. Um, the music master himself, Dylan Raja, happy birthday to you. And keep playing that wonderful saxophone of yours and or any instrument, you play so many. And then there's uh, my neighbor here, it's Lydia, um, let's see, Parvis, I think that's her last name. Happy birthday to you and enjoy your birthday this week. And then we go south of the border to Daisy Pinchera. Happy birthday to you, Daisy. Enjoy your birthday there. We'll be all thinking of you. And I'm going to send that now over to Charlene for a few more birthdays. Yes, good morning. I have three more birthday wishes this morning. I uh, wish a very happy birthday this week to Tanya Taylor and Karen Fasano and David Lyons. We hope you all have a really good week and really great birthdays. And if there's anybody who didn't make it on our list, um, birthday greetings to you as well. And uh, now Erica has some more announcements for us. We have a wonderful ministry on the fourth Sunday of every month called Our Neighborhood Meal. When we go to North Seattle and we feed between 60 to 100 homeless members of our community. And that is coming up next Sunday, March 28th at 4.30. We had a wonderful turnout um, last month. And we are very grateful for all those who participated and gave and served. And we still have a few openings for individuals to bring ingredients as well as some needs to help serve this coming Sunday, um, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, the 28th. And so the, all the information, including the link to sign up is in the email from Thursday. We are also having an after church Zoom social today, which will be a couple of fun getting to know you type of games and nothing high pressure, just some laughs and some uh, a little a way for us to be able to connect again. We'll play three short games. I would like to ask you to have a coin with you, a blue object and a red object and a little a little sentence long fun story about yourself for a round of who done it um, please join us if you can bring your lunch with you we'd like to see and and be inspired by your culinary feats the link it should be in the one is in the thursday email i actually checked and i think gumi and tad um, might be able to put it in the zoom chat or in on youtube as well so on to Terry Smith-Weller for a Sabbath School feature. Two weekends ago, the Children's Ministry staff of the North Pacific Union Conference and the Children's Ministry staff in the individual conferences presented an expo for those involved in children's ministries in the churches. Um, it was presented on Zoom and it had breakout sessions um, the children's Sabbath school teachers in Green Lake were invited to view those presentations and several of us attended. I'm telling you all about this now because although some of the sessions were specific to Sabbath school or vacation Bible school, some were more general and might be of interest to parents or even maybe grandparents. And all those sessions are still available for viewing on the North Pacific Union Conference's website. And I'm hoping Gumi will put that address on the screen. 
Some of those um, that more general sessions that may be of interest um, were titled Guiding Kids to Jesus in the Digital Age, Healthy and Fun Food Ideas for Kids, and they had some pretty creative snack ideas, I must say, um, Children, Nature, and Technology, Teaching Children to Pray, Raising Children to Trust God, um, and Diapers, Training Wheels, and Artificial Intelligence. There are also a handful of sessions that were in Spanish. Now, I haven't seen all the presentations, but in general, I was quite impressed. Um, most of them are only 30 minutes long, and some are only eight minutes long, so it isn't a huge outlay in time. So check it out if you're interested. And um, those Sabbath school teachers that didn't get a chance two weekends ago, are they still up? Feel free to check it out. Thanks. Our last announcement this morning is a very special one from our Green Lake Church Board Chairman, Richard Newman. Hello, I am Richard Neerum, or Kneerum. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Green Lake Church Pastor-Elect Kevin McGill. Uh, Pastor McGill is currently in Troy, Idaho, where he is working with the church members there in a nearby church in North Idaho and in another church in Endicott, Washington. Uh, Pastor McGill was selected from a number of individuals uh, to become the next pastor of Green Lake Church. This was done by the Pastoral Search Committee, chaired by Dana Waters. The other members, um, about 17 of them, will be in an upcoming uh, bulletin I would encourage you to talk to individuals you know about the process, and um, it's a chance to meet some people you may not know yet. Pastor McGill had an interest in social work um, early on and actually received a degree in social work from Walla Walla University in 2008. He received a master's in social work at Eastern Washington University, Spokane and Cheney, Washington, in 2009. The next year he spent as a missionary in the Philippine Islands. Then he returned and um, began a series of, uh, of jobs, opportunities in the Upper Columbia Conference. Uh, Upper Columbia Conference uh, covers much of Eastern Washington, North Idaho, and part of Oregon. He received his M. Div degree, Masters of Divinity degree at Andrews University, Bering Springs, Michigan in 2014. He became an assistant to Don James, Professor of Small Group Ministry at Andrews University in 2014 to 2015. And then he was Associate Pastor of the Village Church in College Place, Washington, 2015 to 2016. Um, and then he went to Troy, Idaho and the adjacent churches. Uh, there, was a, there was a message that was sent by the church office to the Green Lake Church family on March 15 in the evening. If you saw that, you saw a picture of Pastor McGill, his wife, Danelle, their seven-year-old son, Grady, and their four-year-old daughter, M-I-R-A. I would encourage you to look for that email, or if you can't find it, please ask the church office to send you a copy. Uh, one of the other things in that message is a link to a recent article in the Gleaner written by Pastor McGill. Uh, if you want to find more articles, you may do a search with Gleaner and Kevin McGill, and you'll find at least seven more articles he has written for the uh, Gleaner, all very thoughtful. And, and at this time, I would like to introduce Pastor-elect Kevin McGill. Hello, Green Lake Church. Uh, we are excited to be in joining your church family soon, and we wanted to give a short little introduction to our family. So what is your name? Mira. How old are you, Mira? Four years old. I heard there was some other four-year-old girls at this church that are probably curious to get to know you. Tell them about some of the things that you like to do, Mira. What are your hobbies and stuff? I like playing ballerina and oh. 
You like playing ballerina. Did your kitty just jump off? What was your kitty's name? Twinkle. Twinkle. Okay. Ballerina. You like playing with your kitty cat. One other thing that you like to do? Playing princess. Playing princess. She's an active four-year-old little girl. And then next to Mira is? Grady. Grady. And how old are you, Grady? Seven. What are some of your hobbies, things that you like to do? Hot Wheels, football, battle bots, hiking, camping. Nice. And next to Grady... Who is your cat's name? Oh, yeah. My cat is Kingston, kind of snuggly bug right here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and I'm Danelle, and I'm a massage therapist, and I also enjoy hiking and camping and being with my family and friends and we are very excited to move to the beautiful area and get to know you all. And I am Kevin. I like all of these things that my family enjoys. We are an outdoor family and so that's a great reason to be in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. One of the things that we heard about that the Green Lake Church does is a retreat to Rosario and I heard that that might be in September so long as everything goes as planned. So. Yeah, you can get off me. So we are looking forward to getting to know you all more. We just wanted to send a short video greeting. We will finish here for the next two months and then we will officially start with Green Lake the beginning of June. So happy Sabbath to you all and we look forward to getting to know you all more. Can you say bye everyone? Bye! Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction video, McGill family. Um, I'm, we are so excited to have you here. I am also excited to have you here soon. And so thank you again. Uh, a new beginning for Green Lake. It's, we're, I said it before, we're very excited. So today I'm talking a little bit about music. Uh, again, we are in March and so it's Women's History Month and uh, lifting up the music by composers uh, for the Prelude and Postlude. Our Prelude this morning is by Ethel Smythe, who is a British-born composer. Uh, she, her dates are, um, let me, I don't have them memorized, 1858 to 1944. And uh, she actually overlaps in time with the composer of the Postlude, Clara Wieck Schumann, which I'll talk just a little bit more about in a moment. Um, so the piece that we heard for the prelude is one of the chorale preludes that she composed. Now these are kind of uh, more based on the ones that Brahms wrote, but Brahms was paying homage to J.S. Bach, who wrote uh, and kind of created the, well maybe not created, but did a lot with the chorale prelude format, which is where you take a melody, like a hymn melody, and then write music around it that expresses a lot of what's going on in the text. And tomorrow is J.S. Bach's 336th birthday, uh, I think. And so we were wishing Bach a happy birthday. And for organists, um, his music is just quite important. And so I thought it would be fun to play this chorale prelude by Ethel Smythe. Um, she was very active in the women's suffrage movement in England and is famously known for uh, being imprisoned for some of her protests that she participated in. and leaning out her window in the prison and conducting uh, her, her anthem that she wrote for the marchers with her toothbrush. It's a very famous and very true story. She references that herself. And then the postlude by Clara Wieck Schumann. Um, she was born earlier in the 19th century, but they did meet. Uh, she and Ethel Smythe met. And Clara is, of course, um, known very much because she was married to the composer Robert Schumann, but she was an incredible musical force on her own, writing many compositions and also touring to promote her husband's compositions. Um, the postlude today was originally written as part of a set of three preludes and fugues for piano. She did not really write much for organ, but this third one, I've compared it with the, it's been arranged for organ, but when you look at the original, it's very clearly organistic in all its uh, features, including the sustained pedal notes, you know, toward the end and everything. And uh, as often in the 19th century, it's very angsty. Uh, so there's a lot of tension and resolution, and then it finally, it's in minor, so it finally resolves to a major chord at the end. Um, and so you can listen for that as we go through that. So a little bit of 
homage to Bach there using the prelude and fugue form for our composers this week. Uh, then our children's story, we had a little glitch last week, not children's story, but the children's uh, cherub choir piece, and it didn't actually air. I had told you about it with Thank You God. Um, so you will get to see that this week, which I'm so excited. They're so adorable. And then um, our special music today is Ethan Ibsen, Gumi and Nancy's talented uh, son, singing a beautiful piece by Stephen Paulus, words by Dennis Michael Brown, called um, Silver the River, and also with uh, Nancy on piano and a family member playing cello. And so lots going on today in the music, and now we'll move directly on into the opening hymn, which is Come Thou Almighty King, number 71. Please join me for the invocation. Our loving God in heaven, you are love and warmth and light, and we are so grateful to be yours. You show us your goodness and your faithfulness in new ways each and every day. We ask that you join us this morning, being next to us in our living rooms or around our kitchen tables, in our cars, and in any place where we are gathered together. Take away our worries and our distractions our running thoughts, and help us to rest in you with each other, worshiping and praising and celebrating. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you are of a certain age, you may remember these lyrics. Do not wait until some deed of greatness you may do. Do not wait to spread your light afar. To the many duties ever near you, now be true. Brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner where you are. 
brighten the corner where you are. Someone far from harbor, you may guide across the bar. Brighten the corner where you are. This morning our offering is for the local church budget. Things like paying the bills, maintaining our church building and grounds, bringing food, friendship, housing, and hope to our neighbors. That's brightening the corner where we are. Please give as the Lord has given to you. Let us pray. Father, we offer to you our gifts for this, our corner of Seattle. Please bless what we bring and give us wisdom in using it to reach out to our community in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, kids! Today I'm going to be talking to you about filters. So filters are things that we can look through and they kind of change the way everything looks. Uh, so you can put filters on cameras or you could put filters um, on, diff on glasses and different things that you look through and it'll kind of change the way things look. One of the easiest ways for me to talk to you about filters is to show you some of the filters that I have for this camera that I'm using to record my children's story. So if I use different filters, I can make things look very different all around me and I can look different too. I can use a filter that makes everything look dark, like it's nighttime and kind of moody. I can use a filter that makes everything look bright and kind of makes my skin look like I have a sunburn. I can use a filter to make everything black and white, like an old movie. And here's a really fun one. I can use a filter that makes everything look like a cartoon. So I look like a cartoon. And then when I move my face, it follows it and makes me look like a cartoon. The main filter that I wanted to talk to you guys about today, though, isn't a filter on a camera. It's the filter 
that Jesus showed us when he came to earth, and he told us about the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus came to earth, he told stories that were called parables. They were short stories that let everybody know what the kingdom of earth was like. He said that the kingdom of earth was like a treasure, that if you find it, you should sell everything just to get that treasure and be part of it. That the kingdom of heaven is like a precious pearl, that if you found it, you should sell everything and do everything that you can to have that pearl. He told stories about how the kingdom of heaven is like a little mustard seed that when you plant it in the garden, it grows to be a big tree that can take care of all the birds in the garden. Jesus told us that the kingdom in the kingdom of heaven, he didn't care about how important you were or all the things that you accomplished. He loved people who are humble and who sought him and asked his forgiveness for their sins. He also said that everyone was welcome to the feast and the table, the banqueting ta table in the kingdom of heaven. He also said that in the kingdom of heaven, we forgive each other, just like the master who forgave his servant in one of his parables, and not like the servant who didn't forgive someone who owed him. Jesus. Jesus also told a story about workers in a field and how the workers who were there all day got paid the same amount as the workers who were only there for an hour. And that shows us that no matter how long we've been doing God's work or we're out or trying to build the kingdom of heaven, that God values us the same. He told us stories about how even our enemies are our neighbors in the kingdom of heaven and that we should take care of each other. He told a story that was so exciting about the fact that someday the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth are going to be one. And we should be waiting like unmarried women for a wedding party that we shouldn't fall asleep and not be aware, but be ready at any moment for the kingdom of God to come. Jesus had so many exciting stories and parables to tell us about the kingdom of heaven. So this week, I have two challenges for you. One, I would challenge you to ask your parents to read you some of the parables that Jesus told about the kingdom of heaven. And two, I want to challenge you to look through the filter of the kingdom of heaven this week and find ways that you can love and care for others. Thank you so much. Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father God, thank you for inviting us into your presence this morning and greeting us with your smile of acceptance and love. Today we rejoice that spring has arrived. The last 12 months have been filled with stress, anxiety, and sadness. Now as we see the crocuses, the hyacinths, the daffodils, the buds on the trees, we look forward to a brighter future. Thank you for bringing us to a new beginning. Thank you for encouraging us when we thought we could not go on. Thank you for being that constant presence in our lives that assures us that you indeed have the whole world in your hands. You see parents watching their hungry children die. You see war-torn countries where people live one day at a time, realizing that for them tomorrow may not come. You see people desperate for vaccine but unable to be immunized. We know that you weep. Please bring healing in whatever form is needed to all of them and to us. Today, as a church family, we bring our requests for Becky Meacham's sister, Davy Reed, Diane Carlyle, Ed and Alma Gonzaga, Joanne McGale, Mary Churchill, Nola Jean Bambury, Alex Neerum, 
Quinn Wilbur, the family whose child is involved with drugs, the Green Lake Church child care and the preschool workers, and the Lopez family who are mourning the death of Francisco's brother. Please also hear our private prayers at this time for the situations we face. Thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Psalm 37, 23 through 24. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. The New Testament reading is from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Each time he said, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ can work through me. May the Lord bless the hearing of the word. Please join me for a quick word of prayer before we begin. Dear Father, thank you for the words you have given me this week to share with the community that you love so much. Give us all your Holy Spirit, quiet our racing minds, and empty our hearts of the clutter of emotions of these challenging days, so that you, through the Holy Spirit, can fill us with the love and the light that we so desperately want to see and feel in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Since we've been sharing about newness this morning and spring and stunning flowers and a new pastoral family in just a short while, I thought I'd share some news as well. Uh, I've recently become engaged to someone that I love very much, uh, that I respect very much, and that I actually like very much. And not sure if it's the norm or not. It's hard to know what the norm is these days. But a few days after the newness were off, I began to ask myself some relevant questions about the future, some clarifying questions. Because to be honest, getting to know somebody 
uh, during the pandemic has been very different than any other dating experience that I've had before. Uh, for many of my friends in new relationships, as well as for myself, being under quarantine status meant that you had to make somebody part of your pod um, because you only were allowed to have so many people that you could be in close contact with, um, which sometimes equated to spending a whole lot more time together. For some people, it was a dream and it really accelerated the trajectory of their relationship. And for yet other people, it accelerated the parting of ways. And for the third group, it sort of slowed things down to a halt um, because there was an effort that, or there's still an effort that's being made uh, to gather some more real world data points uh, that is somewhat hard to, to get right now. In any of these cases, most would probably agree that the lack of seeing our partners in action around their family and their friends and in their work environments have left us with some question marks. We made many claims about who we are as people. We've talked about life in five or in 10 years, but just like with our relationship with Jesus, confidently believing we know who someone is by reading or hearing about them may require just a little bit more faith than having tangible experiences with them and seeing them in action. So I was having a virtual conversation with someone about these clarifying questions that I had, and I was going on and on in this downward spiraling monologue when they gave me that gently vax sideways glance halting this repetitious run-on sentence that I was in the middle of. And they graciously said, Erica, from an observer's distance, I see. And then they started to download truth after truth after truth about my possible motives, which were correct, and my beliefs and my level of personal ownership that I had not considered before because I haven't put the spotlight on myself. I've watched the Prince Harry and Meghan Markle interview with Oprah last week on the mend. And here's a couple, a real life prince and princess with exorbitant visibility and influence on the world stage, coming from wealth and privilege that I can't wrap my mind around, sitting comfortably across from the one and only Oprah, telling the world they're heavy years long dark night of the soul experience. The fact that they've been betrayed and discriminated against, lied about, and resulting in mental health challenges in this two hour long primetime television interview. And although I really enjoyed listening to the interview and sort of trying to understand the different sides, I was most interested in the polarized comments that I began to read following this interview from all across social media and from across many continents. There were three buckets of comments that I thought were, were relevant. Um, some were upset that these two who were so privileged that they could afford a $14 million home in the same neighborhood that Oprah can would have the audacity to complain about their personal hashtag first world problems as many around the world can't provide for their very basic needs like food and shelter during this pandemic. And there were some others that were irked that anyone would have anything negative to say about the monarchy and that private matters should be discussed privately. And still others, deeply resonated with the day-to-day -day pounding of slander and discrimination and stripping of privacy and lack of support during times of personal crisis from family members who are supposed to be there to offer protection, having to face mental anguish alone to a breaking point. And these comments affirm that it's always the right time to tell your truth. In my very subjective opinion, and I don't claim to be right on any level, 
But as I've been reading about comments, this particular interview, or in the past few months about the state of the pandemic, or the state of our social justice system in our country, from an observer's distance, some of the comments felt very much like knee-jerk reactions to core fears. Jesus lays out a scenario, a story in Luke 10, that seems to fit perfectly with these times, starting in verse 25. And I hope you'll permit me some liberties to paraphrase and add commentary in spoken brackets. Verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus and said, teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life, life without end? Jesus said, what's written in the law? And how do you read it? What's your interpretation of it? So this man said, he was on a roll. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. It's a lot of love. And love your neighbor as yourself. We all know this. Jesus said, yeah, you're right. So do this and live. But he wasn't done. Because I think like myself, I wanted to be edified and maybe I wanted to be right in my clarifying questions. So he wanted to justify himself, verse 29, and asked Jesus, but who is my neighbor? To which Jesus replied with a story. A man was going down to Jer from Jerusalem to Jericho, and it's about an 18 mile trip that winds down through about 3,200 feet of rocky desert terrain where he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him for dead. And you know, maybe, just maybe, this year has made us a bit more empathetic to the experiences of how quickly fortunes can change and how precious life really is. But to make it more relevant and maybe less dramatic or maybe equally as traumatic from a social standpoint. What if what you saw was someone who appeared to have it all together, but you knew that it took them extra effort and extra time to appease those around her, to swallow time and time again, demeaning comments, career roadblocks, closed doors because of the color of her skin, or what if it was a middle-aged man with a foreign accent who has passed over again and again for jobs that he was well qualified for? Or what if it was a man with a questionable record, young, just starting out in life, hasn't made the best choices thus far, but they want a helping hand for a reset in their life? The well-known story continues. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. When I read about these two characters, I thought about all of my runs on Green Lake this year. Last year around this time, I don't run, I slog, slow jog. Let's clarify that. I felt that people were very courteous. There was eye contact. There were even smiles. These days, however, it's almost like making eye contact with someone can be a little scary. It is a completely different type of social feeling. So these two guys, they crossed the other side. They didn't want to make eye contact with anyone. And you want to talk about true social distancing? Here it is. So let me clarify one thing. I'm a healthcare provider, and I am all about following and promoting CDC physical distancing -like guidelines and wearing the mask to reduce the spread of COVID-19. But there is something about being socially distanced and communally distanced that I think we should at least be aware about in this in these times with the opportunities that are presented to us. Can we ask ourselves honestly if this year has made us just a little bit more 
socially distance, maybe engaging less with and in our society and in our community, keeping more of an observer's distance. And maybe this year called for that. And maybe it's something you had to do to feel protected. That's more than reasonable. But has it become a trend in our society at large? These are heavy questions. The beauty of the Christian life is that God has called us to live in community, to see the need, knowing that we're in a position to do something, and also knowing that we are one part of doing something. And it's really God's job to oversee the process. And we could partner with him and he'll give us the courage to give the word of encouragement or the stance of protection for someone or help someone just feel seen or care about or connected. I'll make this personal. I wonder if I don't do the work of looking at myself from an observer's distance, of looking at my actions, which are the byproducts of my thoughts and my beliefs and my emotions, how effective can I really be as a Christian for the world to grow to love Jesus? They may need to see those who represent him as first movers in closing that distance between themselves and the concerns that we see in society. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on it olive oil and wine. I mean, this guy really went above and beyond. Then he put the man on his own donkey in his own BMW, brought him to the inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he says, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Can I share with you that I am hopeful? Don't shoot me. I have been out there working this whole entire pandemic with just a handful of days away. I'm hopeful because this week, out of the 1,600 beds in the four UW Medicine hospitals, only 16 are filled with COVID-19 patients. I'm hopeful that we're moving to phase three on Monday. I'm also hopeful that we started phase 1B tier 2 vaccinations. The truth is, as I look around, fear can sometimes be more contagious than hope. But being hopeful and having peace in the middle of chaos has been one of God's greatest blessings to me this year. Having faith that he will not let us fall and continue to hold us up with his hand like we read in Psalm 37, 23 and 24. Being hopeful that he will be gracious to us, especially when we are at our weakest. And when faith and hope don't come easily, which sometimes it's hard to muster those two things, going back to the basics of 1 Corinthians 13, 13, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And thanking Jesus for the unconditional and the unwavering love that he has for us has many times reset my faith and my hope. And what I love about the Green Lake Church community is that when we do something, we do it with excellence. So my challenge today would be to take a page out of the Good Samaritans book, saying yes to helping meet the needs of people God currently places in our paths, and most importantly, to anticipate the needs and being open to the needs and getting more involved and hands-on, because there will be many, especially as we move through the remaining phases of the pandemic, and we see the aftermath and the backlash of this past year. Our church can close the distance 
and be a place for social and spiritual reintegration in our community. Verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, clearly the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile upon you. May he be gracious to you. And may the Lord show his favor to you and give you peace. Amen.
so much for worshiping with us today as part of our Green Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church online worship service this morning. We'd like to welcome you back next Sabbath at 9.30 for our Sabbath school sessions and 11 o'clock for our divine worship service. After this session in just a few minutes, uh, maybe 12.15, let's give us some time to get some things done. We would like to invite you back to the after church social on Zoom. And the links can be found either in the e-bulletin or on YouTube or on Zoom for the main service. I would love it if you would bring a coin with you uh, as well as find a red object and a blue object. I'm probably gonna find some books around here that are those colors and one little story about yourself that is short for a round of who done it we would love to have you join us we would love to see you and continue to connect with you have a blessed sabbath